Welcome to Your Next Stop. This is Juliet Hahn. I am a wife, mom, virtual coach, public speaker, and crazy obsessed dog lover. I am so honored to be able to take you into the life of someone that has followed a passion. Every week, I hope you are as inspired as I am. Welcome to Your Next Stop. Hey guys, welcome to your next stop. This is Juliette Hahn. I am super pumped for my next guest because I used to actually babysit her kids, which is so crazy because I feel like we're like the same age, even though I know we're not. But Cindy Zordich, how are you? I'm fine. I'm so happy to see you and to to join today. I know. I love that we could see each other because we haven't seen each other in so long. Like it's crazy. We last time we saw each other was at Giuliano's wedding, wasn't it? Yeah, I know. And then before that, I was telling the kids, you know, I was talking to you today, and I said, you remember a really cute babysitter because all the babysitters are so cute. That's all they remember. Mrs. <laughs> <laughs> Williams started like, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> so funny. I love that. I love that. Oh my gosh. So, and I love your story because I remember being in high school and you just always doing really cool things. So I thought of you immediately when I was when I'm for my podcast. And so share your quote with us first and then I'll get into mine. Okay, great. Um, so this was fun, but I found this quote from one of my favorite authors, Jack London, who was actually a huge inspiration for Jack Kerouac. So he was just a doer. So he said, um, I can only say that if my stories are fierce, then life is fierce. I think life is strong, not fierce. And I try to make my stories as strong as life is strong. And oh, I that, love that. Yeah. I love that. Okay, so mine is allow your passion to become your purpose, and it will one day become your profession. Beautiful. And I thought, yes, and I thought just you know, with <laughs> us, that was, was perfect. Okay. okay, so Cindy, so take us through your journey. Give us a little bit of history of your life and then how you got to what you're doing now and some of the other projects that you've worked on. Hmm. <laughs> It's kind of funny. Today is my um, 33rd wedding anniversary. Oh, um, happy anniversary. Thank you. So it was kind of funny, like talking about like having to reflect back and, you know, think about things that, that I've done or that we've done. And, um, you know, uh, many of those years were not actually physically together. And today we're not together. So Michael's out in Michigan. So it's kind of interesting that I think that a lot of it was adapting to the game and having to move with the game and being in new places that I kind of fell into the different things that I fell into. Right. So, so, so explain to the listeners because they're going to be like, okay, what is she talking about? So th- <laughs> your, your husband is... Right. So my husband is um, Michael Zorich <laughs> and um, he's a, a former NFL player, 12-year pro. And so early on in our dating, he took us to New York for the New York Jets then we were married and went to Arizona for the Arizona Cardinals. I had all my babies in Arizona. And it was like my pregnancy haven. I loved it. Um, right. Beautiful friends there. Then we were there for five years. And then we went to Philadelphia. That's where I met you. Yes. And we were at the Eagles. And my sister, um, Tina, lives right there. So it was like family. And we were in Philadelphia for five years. Philadelphia Eagles experience was like a family, family experience with the team and our family and our friends and everything in the community. So I love that too. And so then after Philadelphia, um, we came home to Youngstown where my husband started coaching my boys and we had more of a like we're here and we were like settled in Youngstown and then he went back into coaching and then he took us, he went to the Eagles to coach and then to Michigan to coach. And now he's still at Michigan. So he went from the University of Michigan to now Central Michigan. Wow. So it's been kind of like everywhere, you know, with the game, collecting people and collecting experiences and just telling the kids like, okay, well, we're off, we're going here now. And this is what, you know, and so instead of making it a negative thing ever, because it never really is, we made it like a positive thing. Like this is what we're going to explore now. And these are the people we're going to meet and, you know, never be too callous by having to move to not just open your heart and do new things and meet new people. I love that. I love mm-hmm. that. So yeah, so, t- so, t- so all those times that you were picking up and, and, uh, you know, you were raising your family, I just remember you always had your hand in something really cool. Like I, I so take us through some yeah. of the projects that you've done, like you definitely always had a passion about doing more. I mean, I just you're, it was such an awesome time for me to babysit yeah. and see and then also babysit Tina's kids, and just see the things that you guys did, you guys always had, you know, passion, and you were always doing something fun. So if you can just Take us through a little bit of, of that journey and then where you are today. Thank you. Okay, yeah, my sister, she is really talented. She's 
crazy talented and everything she touches people say what does your sister actually do and i'm like nothing twice right. <laughs> nothing twice she does it amazing and then that's it but um for me um early when i was in arizona actually i realized i was going to be spending a lot of time by myself with the kids and i also realized that i was counting on michael a little bit too much for like what was happening in my outside world which was his world so i thought i need to find something. And I always loved photography. I always loved writing. So that's when I decided to go to school because I thought, oh, how cool that would be to have something to do this on my own and meet people in the community and do something that I have a lot of passion for. So I went to photography um, classes at Mesa Community College, I had these excellent professors, and then everybody around me became my subjects. So I documented my kids' lives, um, I documented everything and a lot of the players' lives and their children. I have so many wonderful photographs of the, some of the Cardinals with their kids that they cherish, I think, today that I cherish. Yeah. Um, it's just a really fun experience going into the dark room, you know, um, having little toddlers at home. Michael was like, go and do it. And so everybody became my subject. So when I came to Philadelphia, um, they were doing an amazing thing at Eagles Youth Partnership. And I fell into become great friends with Sarah Healthman in Philadelphia and um, also with cystic fibrosis. And, um, and um, Trish Fulvio at Cystic Fibrosis, um, one of the wives that asked me to take over. So with that, I started to say, okay, well, this is fantastic. I can offer my services. Like, what do you need? And that's what I think that you know most. We did the Eagles um, calendar for Cystic Fibrosis. And yes. like, oh my God, we had all the players dress up in different skits. And we had them doing like, um, Ricky Waters was, everybody wants a piece of me. And we had all these <laughs> little kids in the community and Snap, Crackle, Pop with Hollis Thomas and he's wearing these pajamas that like he wants a new pair actually he just told me he wants a new pair of pajamas so we did 12 scenes with the um, you know Philadelphia Eagles and for charity had so much fun and then um, one of the guys asked me would I ever want to go on the sideline to shoot and I was like absolutely I definitely want to go on the right. sideline so I got Southern passes to shoot the Philadelphia Eagles games and I was able to like, oh, that was that was such an experience. Pick the um, brains of a lot of photographers down there to um, learn a lot about that side of the craft and also um, put together some beautiful black and white images of the players and game day sideline shots. Mostly that's what I kind of was turned towards, not so much the game, but what they're experiencing you know, on the sideline, what they're thinking about, what's going on in their heads. And um, there was an excellent photographer, Bob Osman. He's an artist, photographer, and like a master printer. And I became great friends with him and he would print these photos and Michael would go into work on Tuesdays, you know, and um, you know, bring them in on the day off and just set them out on the table. And these guys would take these awesome, like 16 by 20 black and white images of themselves and, um, we also auctioned them off for cystic fibrosis. And that was really an awesome thing to see them displayed like that. Well, um, yes. Right. So I love that. Like it all kind of came together, like all the things that you were doing kind of worked in, in, in like sync together. And yes. I do remember um, very, very vividly because your pictures I loved. Like I, and I loved, I remember hearing the stories of you saying that you did it on the sidelines. So you were capturing their emotions, which is so cool because relationships are so important and seeing what people are going and it's so, so much more than just the game. And so many people think, oh, it's just football, it's just football, but you were capturing their lives, which is so yeah. beautiful and then displaying it. And I do remember, and I don't know if this, and you'll have to stop me, but if this was a little bit later in your career, but you used to do this really cool thing with the black and whites where you would paint like a little foil stuff and some of the things that they were, I mean, gorgeous, gorgeous pictures. Yeah, that I remember um, falling into that. Um, I actually learned that in Mesa. Um, just using the oil paints and relaxing and you know pulling things out and that was before really anybody was doing that and it was just really fun to take another process and um, see that happening you know when I see people doing that too I, I understand like the craft takes you so many places like I look at it like it's been a huge gift to me to take me to in the mood that I'm in and what I need from it it seems to give to me and give back to me and when you say passion and make that be what you do to me it's been the one thing that's been constant but changing all the time you know so yes I did that for a little bit and that was fun and then you move on to something something else you know you just kind of go with what's happening in your life
Right. And I, and the one thing I do want to highlight, I love that you said, you know, Michael, you know, was, was traveling and doing things and you realized you loved being a mom, but you also knew that you wanted to do more for yourself. And it's so important mentally and emotionally. And I think a lot of times women, if their husbands are doing something big, they don't feel like they have the voice to, to do anything. Right. They're like, okay, this is my position. But I love that, like Michael encouraged you. And also your, I mean, your background and who you are and who you were raised by, like, that's not something. And he, obviously, Michael, you know, fell in love with that. You weren't going to just sit there and be miserable and be like, okay, I don't have anything else. So you were a go-getter. Like you went and did something because you knew you had to fulfill something for yourself and include your family in it, which just makes everything even better. Right. But I have to be honest with you. When you say that, um, probably the most important thing that Michael said to me that pretty, pretty much prompted this and was important in our marriage too, is that, um, you know, when we were playing in Philadelphia, in um, Arizona, we decided to have Youngstown be our base. So we moved to Youngstown and that's always been our base. Well, so Michael came into Youngstown and he was so happy. I mean, he had all his family here, his friends here. Every time he went out the door, it was like, oh, you know, and um, I wasn't sure, I think probably because I was a brat. I was so I was like mad at him for being happy. I was mad at him because he was doing what he loved to do. I was mad at him because he was living at home. And so I was just being like miserable. And um, so we had to go to the car dealer one day and we were dropping off, you know, I was dropping him off to his car, his truck. And um, he just turned to me, he's like, you know, um, I'm not responsible for your happiness. Like, I, I'm not here to, to, I don't make you happy. Like, that's all on you. But, you know, like you seem to be, you know, mad at me about things, but like, it's not my job to make you happy. You need to figure that one out on your own. You know, I was just like, then I went, wow. <laughs> then I was like driving, thinking about how I was acting. And I was really mad at him because he was happy and doing what he loved to do. And I was feeling like, what am I doing? You know, what am I? Like, I I don't even know what I am. I had no definition of self at that time. Right. And um, so that was like pivotal like in my life. Like, I remember thinking, he is not responsible for my happiness ever. Like, never. Right. Right. Know? And I think that's so important. And I love that you just said that because that is like, so if you guys are listening right now and you're thinking, okay, I'm not happy and I'm, you're looking for someone else to make you happy. Just what Cindy said, it's not, it's not anyone else's responsibility. It's your own responsibility. So you need to get up and do something. So thank you for sharing that. That's, a, you know, I think really important. Yeah, it was important. And it was like, if he were doing things that were making me unhappy, well, then that is he could control that, you know, hey, change your behavior, be fair, you know, do what you need to do. But he was truly, honestly, just happy. And I was like, mad at him for it. <laughs> right, right, right. You know? so, until you yeah. until you figured out your path, which is cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So then take us to the next passion that you, you followed. Well, so the next thing was, um, this was really important to me. Um, we were in Philadelphia. And it was getting to be the end of Michael's career. And like you knew it was the end of his career because like our precious neighbors would say, oh, Michael, don't listen to anything they say on the radio. We love you. <laughs> You're like, oh, my God, what are they saying on the radio? Right. So, you know, you kind of knew like the ending was coming. And our buddy, Andy Harmon, he actually had gotten let go right in the middle of the season. And so it was, you know, just weird, you know, all of a sudden. Andy wasn't there. So we were like, well, we have to go to dinner. We all needed to go to dinner, like KT and Joyce and I and Joyce and, you know, Rat Hall. And we went over to Andy and Chrissy's house for dinner. And we talked about every single thing you could imagine in life but the game. It was like nobody played football all of a sudden. Nobody, like none of us. Nobody had anything to do with the game. And so, you know, I got in the car with Michael and I was like, God, Michael, is this what it's going to be like when we're done? I mean, like, is that is that what happens? It's just like... You, you just, it disappears. You fall into this hole and like nobody talks about it anymore. And he's like, babe, that's just the way it is. Like nobody wants to talk about it. Like we don't want to talk about what we're doing in front of him. And he doesn't want to talk about it because he's not there. So that's just what happens. Nobody talks about it. And I was like, oh, that's crap. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that. I mean, I, we need to talk about this. Like I need to know what we're in for. Like I want to know what's going to happen. Right. So, and, um, and so when I said, I need to know what happens, you know, when he goes, he goes, when the clock runs out and I'm like, yes, what happens when the clock runs out? So, oh, now I have to do this. I have to interview everybody. I need to do a book. I need to know what is up. What am I in for? So for the next few years, while Michael was playing, 
I was writing with Bill Lyon, who I love from Philadelphia, great Philadelphia iconic sports um, writer. Jimmy Solano hooked us up together. He would, I would find the stories, he would write the stories, and I would photograph the, the <gasps> couple and the player. Uh, I like, love that. It was so fun. We had some really great people. Like we had Chuck Bednarik, we had Mike Didka, we had Dan Reeds, KT was interviewed later, um, Ron Wolfley, my buddy Bill Fralick, um, Pat Summerall. Um, so many, so many wonderful like athletes shared their story about what it was like when they had to let go of this game that they loved so much. And in my ear, every time I went to photograph them were the wives who would pull me aside and tell me what it was going to be like for me, which I just so appreciated. And um, so when I, the book was done and we were doing the big book launch, Michael wasn't re-signed. So, um, you know, of course, all the microphones went to Michael, like, Michael, how do you feel that you're living your wife's book? And he was like, I don't want to talk about the book. I'm still playing. I'm like, I'm still playing. <laughs> right. Right. He's like, I'm not living the book. I'm still playing. And I was like, sorry, Michael, timing sucks. <laughs> That, yeah, that had to be hard. So what was the, what is the book's name? It's called When the Clock Runs Out. That's right. Because when, when he said that. Out, it's with that title right then and there. I'm like, that's what I'm going to do. When the Clock Runs Out, it's 25 stories of players who shared what it was like when they had to transition out of the game, the, some of the heartache they went through. Um, then they got, I always wanted to be like, not that they came, became completely successful, but at least that they got through the transition. Like I needed to show other women and other guys that you will get through the transition but it is real you know right so when michael was going through transition it was like i was like okay i just kept hearing you know like tommy mcdonald's wife listen it's temporary this is not going to be the man that you're going to be married to the rest of your life don't leave him like right away because <laughs> it's not really him <laughs> just get <laughs> through it so i was um working and he was teaching himself to play the piano and working out and working to get another team. And I just let him go, you know, and just let him do what he needed to do to get through the transition. And there were times he was really miserable and mad and angry. And I remember Christina Lori asked us, hey, do you want to come to the Eagles game because it's in Pittsburgh and you're right there? I'm like, Christina, I would be there in a minute. But unless you want Michael jumping out of your booth onto the field, <laughs> she's like, oh. I'm like, yeah, he's just not there yet. And um, and then he said one day he, he, he realized he couldn't play anymore. And that's when he was like, fine. You know, like he realized physically, okay, I know now and I'm ready to, to go. And then the boys were at the age where they were playing and now he was loving that. And he dove into their careers, which was right. Fun. Which yeah. is really fun, but that has to be a really hard tradition, and I think I, I mean uh, a really hard situation to go through. So I love that you brought that up. Like that was his life, and and then you needed to be there to support it, but also like your friend said, you've got to give them space because they have to figure it out themselves. And so uh, it's going to be all those different emotions. It's going to be all those different things that you feel, but you don't know how to express it because you're pissed. You're like, why yeah. is this ending? Absolutely. So I was like, Michael, you're so blessed. People don't play that long, you know. And he's like. I'm not, no, I, I, I'm not done. Like, I don't want to hear things like that. When you say that, that makes me feel like you're saying I'm done and I'm not done because he couldn't believe that he was done and he wouldn't believe that he was done and he, and he couldn't do what he needed to do, you know, um, which was make sure, absolutely make sure every door was closed. And um, that was hard for him. And, and it's hard for anybody that's transitioning out of what they love to do and can no longer do it. You know, that doctors that have to give up their craft that are so talented at their craft, you know, people, you know, marriage, you know, be, you know, just like, just hard to let go of things. And yeah. um, so I did respect it. I did. Yeah. Especially after listening to so many awesome stories. Well, I think what that probably set you up a little bit for it, right? It was like, okay, the universe kind of put this together because it was like, we're going to help you transition into this, which is a beautiful thing. So you kind Absolutely. of heard uh, what other people went through. So, okay, so then you launched the book and and then Michael's career, you know, it, it did come to an end and he realized it, which is nice that he was able to realize that your kids were starting to play sports and stuff. And mm -hmm. so then where, where does this take you? Now you guys are in Ohio, is that correct? Yes, we were. And um, I was really, it took, a, it was a lot doing the book and it was a lot of time. And even from what I was told afterwards, um, I, you know, I was published through Triumph Books and 
now that it was done, uh, Mitch Rogatz said to me, now your work begins. And now you have to go out and market your book and get your book everywhere. And I really had to think about that. And I really had to like, I'm looking now at like an you know, eight year old and a you know, six year old and I'm looking at my daughter and she's four and I'm thinking to myself, do I, I you know, well, I wanted to write the book to share and to spread this advice, but do I want to give up, you know, what I have here to go out there and promote it? So I was kind of like, you know, I'm going to settle in here and, um, you know, like my dad would always say, Hey, it's not your turn. You know, it's their turn. And I didn't want to miss too much. So now I wanted to create work around here and I didn't want to. So I, I, I was happy I did it. It was on audio and I was so pleased with it. But I um, made the decision to kind of like concentrate on what was happening, which was so much was awesome stuff was happening around here. So I took my work to more studio work and portraits and photographed anybody and everybody that wanted to be photographed. Um, I lost my mind a little bit and is what I called a term full blown, which I was having this awakening as a woman. So now I wanted to photograph women and my friends and document what they were experiencing as uh, we, at the time we thought we were so mature. We were 36 years old. <laughs> that makes me laugh. Really. <laughs> that was, yeah, that's 10 because I'm 47. So that's like 10 years. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Like, you know, this is full blown, you know, you're, you're, there's this final burst and when, so I did this, um, a, a few shows called Under My Skin and I was writing, writing, writing about being full blown. And we always were like, full blown is when you're in a, a crowded room. My one friend would say this, Renee, you're in a crowded room and you're looking above all the women and you're like, is anybody else out there feeling like me? It's this restless, antsy, crazy feeling that you get as a woman where you're just like, can't be tied down, you know? And it's a, it's, it's a phenomenal like energy. You know, yes. and, and it is also, it has a circle and it comes and then it goes. And my thing to women was like, when this comes and goes, don't, don't leave your family, just go through it and just tell them you're a little bit nuts right now. So anyways, I did this full blown and it took me into therapeutic work and uh, a really awesome guy out of Youngstown asked me if I would do some after school programs and do therapeutic photography for kids and to get them to talk about what they were feeling. So I did that for like five years with these young kids that we would go after school and get them to open up like, what's going on inside of your head? What is it that adults won't let you talk about? You know, what is your vision of yourself? What's going on at home that you want to document to communicate? And so they were doing all these awesome, you know, photo exercises and that's kind of in a box somewhere that someday I want to do like a workshop box, but a oh, book. I that's, love that. Yeah. It that's really was pretty interesting, you know, like to get them, you know, at one point this one kid was like, well, I'm not allowed to talk about that. So we did a thing where we put tape all over each one of the kids mouths and wrote the subject that they weren't allowed to talk about. And then they did self portraits and then their families came to see the show and they were like, what do you mean? And a lot of, who said oh. you want to talk about that? And it's like, well, you always say, shush, you know, like, we'll talk about that another mm -hmm. time. And it's something I really want to talk about. And so I was like, happy that it was like making things happen. Right. Kids, you, you were know? giving them a voice because I you know, what? that's it's something that's it's that's really um, dear to my heart is, you know, I think growing up in certain generations, it's always kids are seen not heard, right. And I think that and I know and I know you raised your kids this way as well. I always tell my kids, even if you don't think I want to hear it, I want to hear it. I want you to question me. I want you to like, even if you're like, mom, I don't agree with you. I want you to tell me that I want to get into discussion about this because your opinion matters to me very deeply. And I think that it's gotten better as generations has have grown. So I love that you did that because I'm sure those kids also were like, okay, someone does care what I think and feel. Oh, they were just incredible and they were so honest and you know, it was, it was awesome that they wanted to take part and they really participated. And I just felt like it, it was so helpful and they, a lot of adults don't realize it, but they pick up on our cues. They, they know when we don't want to talk about things and they know when it gets uncomfortable. And so they, they pick up on that and then they'll kind of like divert away from that conversation. So it is good to get them to, to talk and then bring that work home. And with a lot of the parents, they were like, Whoa, where did that come from? You know, where like, I didn't, I didn't know that you saw us like this because we do a lot of text and photographs and, and the work was incredible too. 
I'm we sure. Go. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. I love that you were doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was really, really great. And, um, and then Michael went back to Philadelphia and Michael Vincent, um, went into, he was at Penn state at the time and just graduating. And when Michael went back to Philadelphia to coach, um, it was like really exciting. And then all of a sudden I was like back in my NF- NFL world and I'm like, where is everybody? You know, I'm like, where, you know, where's all, where's all my girls? And, you know, I want to get in touch with everybody and, you know, just like dive back in. Right. And so a few things happened with that. One was Michael, my son was a free agent at the Carolina Panthers and he went to, you know, mini camp. It was like rookie camp. And when he came home, there was an amazing brochure in the back of his truck, like scrunched in with all of his dirty laundry that he was bringing home from his visit. You know, and I, and I put it on like, I'm like, Michael, like, what is this? This is awesome. It's called Q5. And it was everything he needed to know as a rookie going into the game to prepare him. And NFL player engagement put it together. It was so good. But it was in the back of his truck. Right. So, so I called on um, Troy Vincent, who played with Michael, who at that time was the, the head of NFL player engagement, and now he's the you know executive vice president of football operations. Yes. I called Troy, and I was like, Troy, I found this amazing brochure in the back of my son's truck. You know, like we need to figure something out so that this important information and all these amazing things you were doing are getting into the women's hands because we make them see it. We make them read it. Right. You know, so you have to get this. We, you know, you need to think about the, the, the women. We will help you get this great information into the players' hands through the moms or the wives or the spouses. And so Troy was like, okay, that's crazy because I just started, we just started this resource initiative with women and I want you to be a part of it. So at that point, um, so much fun, kind of like, collision of all the things I love I started to write articles for NFL player engagement specifically for women and leading them to the resources I and love that, that was so much fun it was like we had a cool staff we had to go to New York to meet and brainstorm and I just was like this is cool you know and and getting to talk to NFL women about things that I thought were important for them to know, especially having been through so much, you know, and through of the transition and now going into it as a mom was like really interesting, you know, and a, a new perspective. So having Alex play D1 and Michael play D1 and then Michael, of course, play. And then now Michael's, you know, a rookie. I felt like, wow, I'm just like riding along all these different aspects of this football world. And I feel like I have something that I could share that might help other women, you know? Right. And, and I love that you said that the perspective of being a mom, first being a wife, then being a mom, it's a very different perspective. I'm sure it's a very yeah. different, it's a very different thought and world. So I love that you reached out to him and then had this opportunity. He was like, you know what? Yes, this is great. And so it kind of, again, is you were put in the right spot, but you took that opportunity and ran with it and made something big of it. And so I love that. Exactly. And also, you know, just to be fair, there's a lot of things that I've done that just went nowhere. You know, <laughs> like I remember devoting years of my life to these jackets that I wanted to do that had all sports on it and athletes. And I was just like bent over working, 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 and it led to nothing. <laughs> right. But, but at, at the time it probably let, it was like filling something. So like, I always say like, if it's filling a passion, like I just did my hundredth uh, episode with um, this guy named Ryan Holtz and he's a big podcaster and especially he's out of Canada. And he was saying like, why did I start this? Why did I want to share this and, and get this out there? And I said, I know I am in the best place when I am following a passion, when I am like really doing something I love, I know I'm the best mom. I know I'm the best wife. I know I'm the best friend. And so it's really important that like when women or and men are in a situation where they're not feeling great, they need to kind of tap inside and be like, okay, so even that it didn't go anywhere financially, it still fulfilled something that you were looking for, right? right. So it, fill, it fill, filled a bucket. It did. And it wasn't necessarily financially is awesome, but I just was so proud of it. And I, and I couldn't believe that it got to where it was going. And then when I just got that call that said, Oh, you know what? They decided to not like do that. And then you're like, I was a little bit embarrassed. You know, I was like, Oh God, you know, my friends are going to feel sorry for me. My kids, you know, they're like, 
poor mom look all that time and nothing so that was kind of hard to kind of like uh, you know but but it was a little bit of a sting but it was also like even to this day somebody will say hey can you create me one of those jackets that you used to do i'm like sure you know so i'll do it like for friends so it's not completely gone but so i, I you know the thing that you brought up it is true like you got like you worked really hard on something and it didn't go anywhere and so and i appreciate you saying that it stung it hurt and so also i want my listeners to know like because some people won't start something because they're afraid of failure mm -hmm. and they won't do it because they're like well what if what if what if and okay. i just say all the time you just have to do it and you're going to learn i'm sure you learned so much from that experience mm -hmm. and, and and whether it was you know personal whether it was you know something bigger but, but just even if it was a tiny thing you learned something out of that because you did it and as you said, you didn't want your kids to see like I know when I started this podcast, I was like, I will continue it because I told them I was doing it. And I don't want to not do it. Because right. I don't want them to think, oh, mom started that. And then she just left it because I don't want that to be like a, you know, a lesson that they're learning. Right. But sometimes right. things don't happen. And failure is so important. If you don't fail, you don't learn and you don't grow. Mm -hmm. And so everyone's gonna fail. I always say that you're gonna fail. Like, right. I, you know, I, I listen back to some of my episodes, my first ones, and I'm like, ooh, all right, well, that, all right, I put it out there. I did it. And you know what? Maybe my audio wasn't the best. Maybe X, Y, and Z wasn't the best, but I did it. And that's what's important. So I love that you did it. And then you moved forward and you moved on to the next thing. It's not that you let that that experience stop you and not do it. So, you know, yeah. It's true. And even um, in handling it, it ended up being that I ended up doing awesome, cool projects with them afterwards. So in handling it, it wasn't a personal decision. It was just a, you know, they test it out and are people interested in it or are they not? And if they're not, you don't go with it. So I did end up doing some cool things with them afterwards. So it wasn't complete. Like I didn't know it at the time, but in the end, it ended up being a nice relationship. So right, which is great. So mm -hmm. then take us to what you're doing now, because I know you're doing a really cool yeah, so this is um, what I'm. What I pretty much devote right now, like my all of my work to, is um, thread. And thread came about from the Women's Resource Initiative and in writing all these stories geared towards NFL women. I was realizing that, well, who's reading these stories? How are they reading these stories? How are they getting access to these articles and to everything that the NFL player engagement is offering? So I decided to start a private platform like LinkedIn for NFL women. And that wasn't just for me or for NFL player engagement, but for all NFL women. Like, what are you doing? Let's promote what you're doing. Let's keep it within the family. You know, like for instance, if one of the players' wives is doing a podcast, let's get on that podcast. Like, let's help her with her career. Let's help her with her brand. Right. Let's promote each other's groups. There's a lot of wonderful NFL groups out there for women, like Off the Field Players' Wives Association. I'm on the board for that. Um, there's also the PFPMA for the moms, and I love those women. They come right in early on. So, um, you know, there's other private groups groups too. I'm like, let's promote each other. Let's help each other grow. Let's build each other up with this platform so you can share and not be afraid to share what you're doing in business. So because on the social platforms, it's just, you know, you want to open up your guts. You don't want to always hit, get hit with what people are selling. But on thread, you can sell, 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 sell yourself. Oh, so, that's awesome. Yeah. So thread is that way. Um, it's all NFL women. I have like 900 members. Um, and it's just a great way to promote what everybody's doing. And if I go to, um, like, you know, to a new city and I'm in Chicago and I want to see who's around, I can just like search, you know, in Chicago and all the NFL women pop up, you know, that are in Chicago. Oh, I love that. You can check it out. He'll see who, Oh, look what, look what she's doing. And, you know, I can talk to these women if I want to, or, you know, go to their stores, stores or go to their shops, that kind of thing. So I really love that. And, um, but then Thread led to, um, let me think about how this happened, um, with, oh, so in talking to um, player engagement um, at this point, Troy had now had left player engagement and I was working with another group at NFL player engagement with Art McAfee and um, Lauren Loberg and Carla Lyde Bullion. And we were brainstorming one day about welcoming NFL families back into the league um, each year. So I came up with the idea of doing a welcome kind of annual that would be created just to say, you, kind of like for the new guys, it'd be like, oh my God, I got this magazine and like I'm officially in the NFL and the families would be right. like, oh my 
God, you know, you got this magazine and it's all about what's happening in the NFL. Well, that kind of changed and grew into becoming the playbook. And the playbook is a, it's as big as life magazine. And it's a, it's like a book, you know, but so it has, cool. it's really a playbook for the off season for players and their spouses and like the whole NFL community, really what you can do, what other players are doing in the off season to invest in themselves. Like what are they doing in their um, like nonprofits? What are they doing in their communities? What are they doing in education? What the NFL is offering to them, what the trust is offering in terms of workshops and boot camps and um, you know webinars and everything like that. So it's a it's a it's like letting players know and their spouses who these people are behind these great programs, like what their passion was that led them to want to be a part of this and to create these programs and how to get in touch with them so that they could take part in the programs. And um, so that's like I do it annually. So I have to start it in summer and it takes me all the way up until December and all the players get it. I love that. And you know what I love? I mean, just the thing that is that, and it's so important, but like the NFL is really a community and people might not realize that. Like, and I love that you said that you started that with the 900 women. Um, it is a community and you guys all do have something, an experience to share with each other. So mm -hmm. the fact that you're all, you know, in, to, in it together and then helping each other, lifting each other up with, you know, helping them with their business or helping promote that. That's like a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I don't know that I personally knew that the NFL was like that tight and you guys had such good connections and good, um, you know, relationships and support systems for each other. That's oh, amazing. I mean, there's, there's so many directions that goes, goes into like off the field and I'm on the board of off the field. And I just, I love like what we do, you know, it's a real charitable type of situation. Situation. We do this amazing fashion show every year at the Super Bowl and it's always for charities and it's always brings the most incredible people together and um, always sold out. And so to make an impact in the community and even in the NFL community is important. Like we'll start, you know, at home too. Like, does anybody in our community need help? And then there's other groups too that are private that are really there for each other to say like, hey, this is how I'm feeling. And then everybody just swarms in and like they're, I know how you feel. I'm going through that. Right. Too. It is a beautiful community. It is a family community. And the NFL is just, and the NFL, the trust and the NFL PA and NFL player engagement, they're all putting together the legends community, like Tracy Perlman at the legends community. She is a powerhouse. In fact, you should get her on your podcast. She yeah. is. What's really her name? Incredible. Tracy Perlman. She is the vice president executive vice president of um, communications and marketing at the NFL. She is, she's been the NFL her entire career. You know, she started at Hofstra University, then she took an internship with the New York Jets, and then she never, and then she went to the NFL and she's been there ever right. since. Oh, that's she's, so cool. She's the brains behind some big, big programs in the league that you, you would love her. And oh, that's awesome. And so she heads up, now she heads up the Legends community and NFL player engagement. So now everything runs, all these ideas and all these programs and all these things that we're doing like she's really right there like and she's so excited about the spouses and the women and carla lied you know and april donnelly they're like they're there for us to right. say like we, we we know you're out there and we know you're a resource too and we're all going to help each other through you know through each other you know so. right oh that's so cool so tell everyone where they can find you so if people are like, oh, I want to, I want to, and we'll put this all in the show notes. We'll have like the links to your books and all the things that you're doing, but just so people can find you and follow you and kind of follow your journey. Awesome. Yeah. Well, so my site has really everything on there and that's nflthread.com and it has everything on there, even some of my, you know, previous work and such like that. So I think that's the best place too. And I'm on Instagram Perfect. as like thread or Cynthia Zordich, you know, I'm always available to you can find me easily. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that. Okay. So Cindy, what I've been doing um, at the end of each episode, because we've rebranded. And so now it's your next stop is what the podcast is. And I'm creating a workshop to help people actually, if they're stuck and they don't know what to do, but they have ideas and they don't know where to go. I have, I'm creating a workshop to do it. So what I'm asking all my guests at the end of my podcast is what does crazy town mean to you? Crazy town. Um, probably the idea of crazy town, 
just anything so like so i'll give you an example so crazy town to me is like super endearing it's like my energy my kids my dogs my husband just everything like around me my friends i just love that energy so like crazy town like when when i started next up crazy town it really was personal journal stories and i did have interviews but it was really just about funny things that have happened throughout life and taking women out of their like world like when their moms and their you know their kids having a temper tantrum i wanted them to pop their earbuds in and just listen to a funny story and right. so that's where it started and then it's morphed into your next stop which is now i'm interviewing people that have followed a passion right. um so i just have at, like always ask i want people to like what does i mean some people say oh crazy town's negative to them right but to me it's like a very endearing thing so i'm just curious like when you hear yeah. the word crazy town what comes to mind i i think that it's funny you say that bill I would say for me, crazy town reminds me that I'm behind the wheel driving to that next thing that I have to do because like I need to be there. Like I just came from Caddis, Ohio, where my son's opening this butcher shop and I'm driving, you know, from Pittsburgh to Caddis. And then my son, Alex says, Hey mom, I'm working on my place down the hall. Can you meet me there? Pass up home, go straight to him, you know, and I just feel like crazy town is being like, I can't wait to be with my daughter anywhere. Anybody needs me. I just need to be there. Like, that's how I feel crazy town is that you just are like, don't say no. You're like, I have to go. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh my gosh. Cindy, I love this so much. Thank you so much for taking the time and being on, you know, my guest and sharing your story. Cause I just, I, I love reliving it and I don't know, I didn't know, uh, you know, some of it. So I just love that. So thank you so much. Thanks. I appreciate it. It's weird talking about myself, you know, because it feels like I, I'm so wanting to talk about what everybody else is doing. So thank you for that. And <laughs> you're doing amazing things. And you're, you know, you're out there really supporting the community of the NFL women. And I think that's a beautiful thing. So guys, okay. if you like what you hear, please share this episode, share the podcast, subscribe, rate and review. And don't forget to follow Cindy and go to NFL. Uh, what is it? NFL thread.com. Exactly. Okay. I hope you liked this episode of Your Next Stop. Please subscribe to my channel, share with your friends, and join in each week.